Tempest is the god of war and battle. He and his faith advocate for combat proficiency and courage in battle. I am Ben Dignan, and welcome once again to Religion in the Realms. Titles Tempest goes by the following titles The Foe Hammer and The Lord of Battles. Tempest has two known aliases. Among the snowcat nomads found in the other north of Faerun, Tempest is known as the Fist. Each male member of the snowcats is expected to attempt a personal quest to benefit the group in the Fist's name once in their life. Tempest's second alias is Tempos, swapping the U in Tempest for an O. The ragged tribes of Icewind Dale refer to him by his alternate name. Portfolio and Domains Tempest holds the portfolios of War, Battle, and Warriors. Tempest's suggested domain for 5th edition is War. Appearance and Manifestations Tempest is commonly depicted as a large human in plate armor wearing a closed, large helmet. Some descriptions quote his height at 12 feet tall. His armor is always battered and bloodied. No record speaks to Tempest revealing his face, his face always being hidden by a visored helmet. Despite this, it is impossible not to feel his gaze fall upon you. Where his skin is exposed on his arms and legs, there are several bleeding wounds that never heal, though these wounds seem to have no effect on Tempest. Tempest has two powerful outer planar horses that serve as his personal mounts. The first is a white mare he calls Veros, which stands for victory. The second is a black stallion he calls Deros, which stands for defeat. Though I don't know in what in-world language these two names are derived from. It may be that you see Tempest riding atop either of his two mounts, or it is entirely possible you see him standing atop both horses' backs without falter as they charge forward. If someone was to receive an omen or vision of Tempest riding atop Veros, That bodes well for that person's side in an upcoming battle. The complete opposite feeling is felt if Tempest is seen riding Daros. The most common vision of Tempest in this context is Tempest standing atop both his mounts. This is interpreted to symbolize the chaotic and unpredictable nature of war. Tempest's favorite weapon is a battle axe he calls Battle Prowess. He also sometimes wields a black sword. Both these weapons are notched and stained from long use in his hands. Battle Prowess in 3rd edition mechanical terms is a plus 3 battle axe with the chaotic, keen, and speed special abilities. Tempest's avatars share the same appearance as the god himself. Tempest has two no manifestations. As mentioned before, Tempest may appear with one or both his mounts before or during a battle. Typically, the sight of Tempest is seen most at battles of importance and size. Temperan clergy may receive visions of either Tempest, one of his mounts, or a vision of a storied warrior during their prayer. Aside from seeing one or both his mounts, there is no clear pattern as to what these visions might indicate. It is up to each individual to make an interpretation. Only the warriors seen in visions seem to voice any coherent statements or words. If Tempest appears, the best anyone typically gets are grunts or utter silence, though this is a recognized pattern of behavior from Tempest. No record exists stating him or his avatars ever speaking a single word as they appear on Faerun. Lay followers only seem to ever receive a vision of either one of Tempest's mounts. Tempest makes use of the following creatures to communicate his approval, disapproval, or aid his mortal followers. Warrior on Hariar. Eagles, badgers, war horses, war dogs, panthers, tigers, and spiritual apparitions of lost friends in battle. Tempest can also manifest items on the Prime Material to reward his mortal followers. A defenseless person calling out for Tempest's favor may find a weapon laying next to them. Others may find all sorts of other items made of steel, not just weapons and armor, in their daily lives. Tempest has no associated gemstone, 
but he may manifest a particular gemstone that is favored in a person's particular warrior culture. Abilities Across 1st to 4th edition, Tempest has always been listed as a greater power. Despite the lack of rank attributed to him in 5th edition, along with the vast majority of other deities, I feel confident in the assumption that Tempest is also a greater god in this divine hierarchy. Tempest himself has a stat block in 3rd edition's Faiths and Pantheons. I'm only going to highlight some of the key abilities mentioned in this book. As a greater deity, Tempest is granted the best possible result on any dice he rolls. Tempest has divine senses that allow him to see, hear, touch, and smell out to a distance of 17 miles, which is approximately 23 kilometers. These senses are able to extend out from any of his worshippers, holy sites in his name, objects related to him, or any location where his name or one of his titles have been spoken in the last hour. What's more, he can split his attention, extending these senses out to a maximum of 20 places at once. Tempest is capable of blocking the divine senses of those of his deific rank or lower at up to two remote locations for 17 hours maximum. Tempest has a portfolio sense that allows him to sense any battle, death of a warrior, and any violence on favor in 17 10 days or 170 days before it happens, as the battle itself is happening, and then recall the sensation of this battle for 17 10 days afterwards. Two stat blocks can be found for Tempest's avatars across the editions. Third edition's Faiths and Pantheons is one supplement that includes it. The other is second edition's Faiths and Avatars, and is the one we refer to to describe the avatar's abilities given its depth. Tempest's avatar has access to all spell spheres. The smoking red blood that continuously drips from the avatar will singe anyone who isn't a deity themselves as if they were touching acid. However, if someone was to drink it, though I don't know why Tempest's avatar would let you do it, they would be granted a temporary plus two strength bonus. The avatar is immune to enchantments, charm effects and spells, psionic abilities and powers, domination, illusion based magics, and any other deceptions granted through magic. In second edition terms, the avatar can wield a multiple of different plus five silvered weapons. Aside from the bonus to hit and damage along with being silvered, these weapons have no other enchantments. However, each and every weapon he wields is battle-worn and blackened from use. Tempest's avatar hits with triple the base damage of any given weapon. The avatar can instantly summon forth any weapon they desire to wield, and is proficient with any and all weapon and armor types. Personal History Tempest and a few other deities are said to have been birthed out of the energy emitted during the battle between Salune and Shar, known as the War of Light and Darkness back during the very first era of realm space itself. Tempest was not initially as strong as he is now. Rather, he had to fight continuously to become a greater god of war. Before Tempest achieved his current position, he had to defeat other gods of war and battle. The last deity he won against was Garagos. Tempest was a demigod when these two war gods clashed. In the Netherese pantheon, Garagos was called Targus and was known as a greater god. Tempest existed in the Talfiric pantheon. As a brief aside, Talfir was contemporary to Netheril. Talfir existed in what is now the present day Chianthar River Valley in the western heartlands. I'm unsure who might also existed alongside Tempest in this pantheon as it would seem the Talfuric and Netherese pantheons would become enmeshed with the other regional pantheons to form the broader Faerunian pantheon as history progressed. The Temperan faith possesses a sacred text known as the Tome of Fulhammer's Triumph. This book documents the century-long battle between both Tempest and Garagos. Tempest finally succeeded against his opponent as he used Garagos' own savagery against him. The battle between the two can be said with certainty to have happened after the founding of Mithranor, which occurred in 261 Dale Reckoning. For reference, the fall of Netheril was in negative 339 Dale Reckoning. I am speculating when I say this, but I think it is likely that Garagos initially lost a substantial amount of worshippers after the fall of Netheril. 
Then the number of his worshippers continued to be reduced with the Netherese diaspora. This probably dropped Garagos down to a fairer level with Tempest, which enabled Tempest to have a fighting chance. For a long time, it was thought that Tempest had killed Garagos outright. That was until Garagos emerged as a fledgling demigod some time after the time of troubles. Just to touch on it, a Merolith for a good while masqueraded as Garagos, and a cult developed around this Merolith. That was until Garagos saw to it personally that this demon was slain and revealed himself to be active once more. It is speculated that as Faerun influences Mulholland more and more, Tempest may yet come into conflict with Anher, the Mulholrandi pantheon's own god of war. Uthgar is the patron deity and founder of the Uthgart barbarians. Uthgar was a devotee of Tempest during his mortal days. Then Uthgar was known as Uther Gardolfsson, a Northlander raider from Ruathim. Tempest saw fit to raise Uther to godhood as Uther lay dying from the wounds he suffered in an epic clash with the Lord of the Frost Giants in 123 Dale Reckoning. Uthgar did get the better of his foe and also slew the giant. Some even think that Uthgar is a son of Tempest. Before the Time of Troubles, the Red Knight was little more than a cult figure in the Temperan faith. Though she was once a mortal woman who Tempest had singled out as worthy of apotheosis, Tempest would go on to raise her up to become a demigod. The Red Knight's mortal identity remains only known to Tempest alone. Following her actions in Avatar form during the Time of Troubles, a separate branch of the Tempuran faith has begun to identify itself with the Red Knight as their patron deity. I will leave further discussion on the particulars when I cover the Red Knight next. Tempest finds the lawful strategic nature of the Red Knight helps to offset the savage viciousness of Garagos. Tempest appeared atop a strange steed in 902 Del Reckoning at the concluding battle of the Rotting War in the Vilhan Reach. Three different bards all reported that Tempest rode atop a skeletal steed that oozed blood. All generals that were present thought this to be Veros despite the truth. Some of the commanders at this battle ordered that their respective spellcasters unleash dangerous, quote, ancient plague magic to be done with the civil war once and for all. At the conclusion of this final battle, a plague was distributed and brought home across Chondath by both sides. During the Time of Troubles in 1358 Dale Reckoning, it is thought by some that Tempest fell down to arrive in the Dale Lands, specifically Battledale. The Abbey of the Sword, which we will touch on later, was built on this Temper and Holy Site. However, in passing years after tracing the Trail of Tears, not to be confused with the real world Trail of Tears, it is thought that Tempest may have first landed in the Fields of the Dead. From there, he traveled across the continent to a total of four specific battle sites, again which we will discuss later. Following the Spell Plague, Tempest is said to have entered into a relationship with Bashaba, the goddess of misfortune. What's more is Garagos became an exarch under his supervision. I don't know if such relationships exist following the Second Sundering. In my opinion, much has returned to how things were before the Spell Plague. But in lieu of further information coming out later, it is up to us individually to determine how things stand. Personality From 1st edition to 3rd edition, Tempest held the alignment of a chaotic neutral god. In the alternative 4th edition alignment model, Tempest is an unaligned deity. Strangely, Tempest is listed as a neutral god in 5th edition. I do not know why there was such a shift especially considering his description in Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide. Quote, The god of war is random in his favors, meaning that his chaotic nature favors all sides equally. End quote. In his previous chaotic neutral alignment, Tempest was known not to favor any specific side in a conflict. Rather, Tempest would randomly grant benefits and boons across the various sides involved in such a war. This is the way of battle in his mind. Tempest holds his own code and any alliance he is asked to join is tenuous, unless it is an alliance he has made with other deities. He is reserved and cool with the other Faerodian deities. The exception to this behavior, of course, is with the Red Knight. 
Tempest is an energetic, strong, and hardy deity enjoying food, drink, and hunting. But coming as no surprise, Tempest loves battle best. Tempest does not see war as a tragic failing of civilization and diplomacy. Rather, it is one of the strongest forces that civilizations and peoples can bring to bear to enact great change in the world. Personal Realms In the Great Wheel cosmological model used in 1st edition, 2nd edition, and is the assumed default model for 5th edition Forgotten Realms, Tempest resides on the chaotic neutral outer plane of Limbo. His divine realm is known as Night's Rest. This realm isn't mentioned to be on any specific layer. There is a debate as to whether or not you can assign layers to the plane of Limbo as it is. The consensus, however, is that Limbo is just one layer with barriers, realms and domains that change position all the time. Magic use is always subject to some random effect when manifested on this plane. Returning to Limbo requires an individual to reorient themselves completely as things are ever shifting and ever moving. Some have described Limbo as a mixed pot of unique stew whose ingredients change from one moment to the next. Matter shifts through all various forms with no discernible pattern and in random combinations. Complex shapes and forms can emerge, such as continent-sized earth moats and fortresses made of air, but you never can tell just how long such things are going to last. Despite all this chaos, Limbo is malleable to the thoughts of sentient individuals. Through concentrated thought and will, an individual can manifest a desired terrain, structure, and quality of air needed to be comfortable amidst the roiling change. Deific powers are able to maintain the realms of Limbo without the need to concentrate. Most sentient creatures and humanoids, however, must devote portions of their communities or portions of their vast brain power to concentrate on maintaining their various domains and settlements on Limbo. This plane can play havoc with all various types of magic, but we will touch on just how it can affect all spells that are cast on the plane. A spellcaster is subject to a wisdom check to see whether a spell is cast successfully. Upon a failure, the spell is immediately nullified, and instead a wild magic surge takes place. There is far more to be said about Limbo, including information on the Gisarai, Slotty, and other creatures who live here, but it is best to turn our attention back to Tempest. Night's Rest is similar in demeanor and atmosphere to that of Asgard. Battles on Night's Rest are constant and endless. Rather than rising on the next day to fight, as souls do on Asgard, it only takes a short time for a partitioner of Tempest to heal back to full health. From there, that person stands to fight yet again, though for the side who had cut them down before. Cowardice is not tolerated as any caught hiding or fleeing from battle die outright if cut down. In the World Tree cosmological model used for 3rd edition Forgotten Realms, Tempest resides on the plane of Warrior's Rest. Not unholy like Tempest's realm in the Great Wheel, Warrior's Rest is a realm with raging battles, changing loyalties, and terrain that always seems to be in flux. However, 3rd edition's Player's Guide to Faerun does mention that Warrior's Rest does not shift in property as much as Limbo does. All of Warrior's Rest is considered Tempest's realm, though any other deity who lives here is allowed to shape their realm how they see fit, though Tempest always has it within his purview to change such realms. The same properties for petitioners follow as well. Those who are slain begin to regenerate quickly to rise to fight again, though they must shift their loyalty to the side that defeated them. Permanent death is reserved for the cowardly. The land on this plain is similar to a rocky desert. Mesas and buttes can be found spread across the otherwise flat landscape. Though through mental concentration, a person can will the terrain to take a desirable form. Such forms include things like trenches, slopes, chasms, and the like. Player's Guide to Faerun includes a list of such choices and their associated difficulty check values. Aside from the petitioners of the Red Knight and Tempest, Gisarai and their monasteries can be found here. Petitioners leave the Gisarai monks alone, for if one of the monks kills a petitioner, their soul is destroyed outright due to the lawful alignment held by these monks. Titans also live here and love to engage with the petitioners in endless battle. Speaking of petitioners, the souls here look much as they did in their mortal lives, though at peak shape and form. 
Warriors of all stripes and creeds are found in the battles on Warriors' Rest. Within the 4th edition World Axis Cosmological Model, Tempest resides on the dominion known as Warrior's Rest out in the Astral Sea. Much like the description given in the World Tree, this dominion is covered by rocky badlands that shift while battles rage non-stop across the landscape. Tempest will move from hall to hall, celebrating with the victors. Such victors are allowed to revel in their glory as long as they wish, so long as they hold off any attacks directed their way. Tempest may be found occasionally in Bashaba's lone granite tower called Blood Tor, found on Warrior's Rest as well. Tempest's exarchs, the Red Knight, Valkyr, Ufgar, and Garagos all have their own realms here. Allies and Allegiances Tempest's chief ally is the Red Knight. The relationship between the two has been likened to that of a proud, protective father and an intelligent daughter. The two are often with one another as they hunt, tell stories, and study the various battlefields of the past across Faerun. Tempest holds what you may be considered casual alliances between those who are martially inclined or benefit his portfolios. Nobanyan, which I know I've been pronouncing Nobanyan in past episodes, Gond, Valkur, and Uthgar. Gond and his faith create all sorts of contraptions and weapons usable in war in armed conflict, which Tempest has a vested interest in. Outside of the Faerunian pantheon, Tempest is allied with two dwarven powers, Clan Geddon Silverbeard, the dwarven god of battle and valor, and Hela Brightaxe, demigoddess of both luck and joy in battle. Enemies Despite what you might think, Eldath, the goddess of peace, is not one of Tempest's enemies. Tempest thinks Eldath is a naive weakling, but he holds that without peace in the world, war would not have anything to help define it. Temperans are taught to leave Eldath's places alone. Those who do not heed this teaching aren't long from Tempest's wrath. Sunni regards Tempest as a foe, though Tempest does not feel the same way about her. Rather, he sees Sunni as irrelevant and too capricious to be worth his attention. Garagos was once a foe of Tempest. Now Tempest tolerates his savage and brutal nature in the hopes that Garagos may draw out further competition that Tempest can swoop in and take out himself. Shantia and Tempest hold some sort of eon-spanning contest that is cordial in nature, though no further details about this contest are stated. In effect, I cannot find anything to suggest otherwise. Tempest has no enemies. Symbols. This is relatively simple. Tempest's faith has one known symbol. A silver longsword surrounded by flame on a red shield. Central Dogma. From Faiths and Pantheons, a third edition supplement. Quote, Tempest does not win battles. He helps the deserving warriors win battles. War is fair in that it oppresses and aids all equally, and that in any given battle, a mortal may be slain or become a great leader among their companions. It should not be feared, but seen as a natural force, a human force, the storm that civilization brings by its very existence. Arm all for whom battle is needful, even foes. Retreat from hopeless fights, but never avoid battle. Slay one foe decisively and halt a battle quickly rather than rely upon slow attrition of the senseless dragging on of hostilities. Remember the dead that fell before you. Defend what you believe in, lest it be swept away. Disparage no foe and respect all, for valor blazes in all regardless of age, sex, or race. Tempest looks with favor upon those who acquit themselves honorably in battle without resorting to such craving tricks as destroying homes, family, or livestock when a foe is away or attacking from the rear, except when such an attack is launched by a small band against foes of vastly superior numbers. Consider the consequences of the violence of war, and do not wage war recklessly. The smooth-tongued and fleet of foot that avoid all strife and never defend their beliefs wreak more harm than the most energetic tyrant, raider, or horde leader. End quote. Presence of the Faith Tempest's clerics tend to hold an alignment of chaotic evil, chaotic good, or chaotic neutral. 
Although, given how broad his portfolio is, you can find a good portion of worshippers who are spread across the rest of the alignment spectrum. Typically, Tempest is worshipped by warriors, fighters, barbarians, and rangers. He also holds devotion from a sizable portion of half-orcs. Tempest receives his greatest amount of worship preceding any battle. Among the Northlanders of the Moonshay Isles, Tempest is held to be a god of storms. In the description, I have linked a tweet from Ed Greenwood. Ed explains that Tempest hasn't trodden on Talos' territory. Rather, the Northlanders attributed storms to Tempest because often when they went into battle or raided, a storm would whip up. Temperan Northlanders frequently are berserker warriors who rely on their frenzy and rage in battle. Some Northlanders sacrifice a couple prisoners in Tempest's name following a strong victory. As of late, Valkyr has found a greater following among the Northlanders compared to their former favoritism for the Fohammer. This fact is not attributed to his faith, but Tempest's tears, aka red tears or Tempest's weepings, are teardrop-shaped crystals of a vivid fiery orange, cherry red, or blood crimson color. The tales of bards tell of how these gems are formed through a combination of a lover's tears for a lost warrior and the blood of those who fall in battle. Though it must be said that Tempest's avatar left these gems trailing behind him as his avatar walked Faerun during the Time of Troubles, the blood dripping from his unhealing wounds forming into such gems. Tempest's clergy have a long and storied history fighting past centuries on the continent. Any veteran can tell you that, at one time or another, they found themselves in combat with a temporary cleric. In one battle, they fought alongside such an individual. Then they can easily recall a battle where they fought against another temporary. Those in need of mercenaries are known to approach temporary places of worship to hire out the local clergy to serve on their side of battle. However, a temporary may never be hired to serve a military leadership position. Temperans only operate in this capacity when the Tempern faith strides out to fight their own battles. In general, soldiers and warriors have respect, or possibly begrudging respect, for the Tempern clergy. Mercenaries are sure to keep their word to the client that hires them out. If it is found out that they have not, Tempurans are quick to spread the tales of such disloyal companies broadly. Only the most desperate or indifferent will hire these mercenaries in the future. Temperans usually preside when written contracts are drafted between company leaders and the clients hiring them. Hierarchy and Structure of the Clergy Collectively, the clergy of Tempest might be referred to as battle guards and or hammers. Temperans are first and foremost a clergy steeped in a warrior ethos and practice. Several of Tempest's clerics end up multiclassing into the fighter class. The Tempuran clergy has a large male and human makeup, though they welcome anyone of any gender or race into the faith. A significant portion of the Tempuran clergy will not be found in temples at all. Rather, they attach themselves with the armies of nations and kingdoms, or with mercenary companies. In this capacity, they will fill the role as battle chaplains. Since the Tempurans can be found on any side of a conflict, the faith holds no central authority to mandate which sides to support. However, each temple holds itself to a military ethos with ranks and a chain of command. In the wild spaces of Faerun, specifically the areas where the ragged barbarians of Icewind Dale, Narfal barbarians, the Northlanders of the Moonshays, and some Sharan tribes reside, the Tempuran faith is presided over by shamans. Uthgart tribes may harbor shamans of Tempest as well, given his perceived familial ties with Uthgar. Though these shamans hold a lower station than the shamans of the various beast totems. In 2nd edition, when this is described, the source is referring to the specific shaman priest class. In my opinion, in 5th edition, a shaman in this role would just be a cleric who thematically looks and acts like an individual from one of these regions, maybe even multiclassing into the barbarian class themselves. Unless I misread how the ranks of the Temper and Faith are introduced in 2nd edition's Faith and Avatars, the book seems to just list off some examples of ranks found throughout different Temper and places of worship. Such examples include War Priest, Swung Sword, Terrible Sword, Lance of the Lord, Shield of the God, Battle Lady or Battle Lord, 
swordmaster or swordmistress, and lord or lady of the field. Titles awarded by the faith supersede any of these ranks, though. In the later edition agnostic sourcebook, Elminster's Guide to the Forgotten Realms, we are actually presented with a tempern rank structure. In ascending order, it is as follows. Acolyte, Stalwart, which is the first rank of full clergy, Hardhar, which is warrior priest, Arahar, the battle chaplain, Rothar, swordmaster, Dyerhar, guardian priest, and Warlion, high priest. After the Red Knight became a goddess through Tempest, Temperance held her in veneration as a secondary figure to their patron deity. Following the Time of Troubles, a separate clergy for the Red Knight formed. Still quite small compared to the broader Temperant faith, Tempest is said to have encouraged the formation of a new branch. Temperance are said to have gritted their teeth and went along with it, given that it was mandated by their patron deity. Responsibilities and Duties of the Clergy and Worshippers Temperans are responsible for maintaining proper rules of war when involved in or advising on a battle. They will not allow unnecessary death and bloodshed. Core to their beliefs and responsibility is their own code called Tempest's Honor. 1. A poor unnecessary feuding which can lead to further pointless battle and death. 2. Temperans are expected to learn all sorts of battle skills and weapon techniques. They are then to pass on these abilities to others to better fight off attacks which threaten home and civilization alike. 3. Temperans hold a strong disdain for cowardice and the punishments in the faith are steep. 4. No insults are to be hurled at enemy combatants who engage in honorable battle. And finally, 5. Those who are in need of a weapon to fight are to be provided with such arms. Warrior veneration is practiced in Tempest's faith. Often clergy will collect the weapons and armaments of storied warriors. These are then put in a place of prominence in a respective place of worship. Despite the conditions of such items, Temperans hold that some essence of the warrior is still retained within. Temperans have also been known to bind the whole soul or essence of a warrior's soul to a weapon or armor to provide advice for the faithful as sentient items. Other memorials and gravestones of such warriors are well tended and the names of these warriors find their way into Temperan prayers. What is important to know is that such veneration comes after the death of the warrior. While a Temperan lives, they are never to personally advertise themselves as a great warrior, tactician, or the like. Recognition comes posthumously and best after a worthy end in battle. Each Temperan clergy member is expected to spill at least a few drops of blood once every ten day. It is best that this blood comes from them or a worthy opponent they encounter during that time. After blood is shed, they sing the Song of Swords, one of the core rites in the Temperan faith. Those who use underhanded tactics in warfare are believed to be some of the worst sinners in a temperance eye. They reserve punishment for those who engage in such things as poisoning water supplies, torture during wartime, and attacks upon non-combatants. Any warrior found using such tactics will have their story spread throughout the temperance clergy and out into the broader public. Only through proper atonement will this reputation be expunged. Temperans are taught to have some proficiency at the forge and anvil. Some develop this skill further than others. Orders and Priestly Bodies Following the Time of Troubles, the Red Fellowship Monastic Order would announce themselves as the first organized and distinct body in the Red Knight's faith. This order once existed within the Temperan faith proper. Though this order is still strongly allied and held under the umbrella of Tempest's wider faith, as the Red Knight still holds a strong alliance and bond with Tempest. We will only mention it in this episode as the Red Knight's own episode follows this one. The Order of the Broken Blade is an order strictly for the injured and maimed in Tempest's clergy who cannot fulfill a primary role out on the front lines. This order fulfills a support role and maintains many temper and places of worship. Members swear an oath to defend their assigned place of worship to their dying breath. The Order of the Steel Fang is an elite unit of battle-hardened Temperans. They are strictly assigned to high-hazard areas, full of danger and peril. 
Many mercenary companies and orders of knights openly display their connection to the Temperan faith, though they are not under the command of Temperan clergy. Several mercenary companies adopt the badge of a rusty dagger pointed up and to the right, dripping four drops of blood. This badge is an open announcement of their Temperan connections. One source calls out that there is no orders of Temperan paladins. That isn't weird to me, though I could totally see an order of Temperan paladins, ones who are strict adherents of Tempest's code though. If not, paladins who operate within a pre-existing order like the Steel Fang. Battleforges are a specific group of Temperans who are accomplished weapon and armor smiths who share their made wares with fellow clergy. For a battle forge, the creation of a new item in support of the faith is the best form of devotion to Tempest. Given their experience at the forge, they are adept at determining any bonuses and abilities attached to a piece of martial equipment. Weapons of their creation and wielded by them can damage foes who have inherent resistances and immunities to otherwise non-magical properties, though they lack the ability to turn the undead. Glory Bloods are fanatical Temperans who are proficient in all aspects of warfare. They lead on the front lines, inspiring confidence and bravado in those around them. Issue being, Glory Bloods love to charge headfirst into combat despite any imbalance on the sides of the conflict. They are a chastising and overbearing sort who are easy to criticize the failures of others around them. They are also vengeful sorts who do not like to retreat. If need be, they will retreat but swear vengeance upon those they lost too. Those around Glory Bloods in combat are granted small but impactful bonuses to initiative, to hit, and damage. Glory Bloods have no access to healing magics and are unable to turn the dead. Appearance and Dress Throughout all forms of dress, Temperans never wear close-faced helmets or any covering in general to obscure the face. To do so in their mind would be to imitate Tempus. Such imitation is viewed as an affront. Rather, Temperans favor open-faced helms or skull caps to protect their head. Temperan ceremonial robes always have a crimson red trim woven throughout to emulate the color of blood. Robes vary in color to signify the various Temperan ranks. Darker colors are worn by the lower-ranking members of the Temperan clergy. Middling war clerics wear robes of brown or purple. Red or amber is reserved for the senior ranks. Finally, white or yellow is worn strictly by the highest ranks in the Temperan faith. Senior clerics are not often found without their battle axes, and many wear spike gauntlets as another mark of their rank. Elminster's Guide to the Forgotten Realms attributes given battle wear to the Temperan ranks I mentioned earlier. Acolytes wear leather jackets and baldrics. Stalwarts wear chainmail. Hardhar wear breastplates with bracers. Arahar wear splint mail. Rothar adorn themselves with spiked shoulder pauldrons as part of the plate mail. Finally, warlines wear gilded magical plate mail that grants them the ability to fly. When adventuring, Temperans prefer well-worn and battered armor. A given number of these traveling members are almost always seen traveling in their armor. Unlike some of the flashier face, shall we say, Temperans are more for function over form. Thus, armor is not often shined or made up for show. Heavy armor like plate mail is the preferred armor type. Some itinerant clerics go without any sort of armor. Battle forges are often seen with armor and weapons that are in far better shape than their peers. This is understandable given that they spend more of their time in the shop rather than out on the battlefield. Their dress is that of a suit of plate mail with a crimson sash that runs from shoulder to hip. Their preferred weapons are warhammers and swords and they go without head protection. Glory Bloods could easily be mistaken for any other member of the Templar and clergy while they are out adventuring. They favor the same equipment and appearance. However, there is an unmistakable aura of authority that every Glory Blood gives off. Rituals Temperan clergy pray and meditate on their spells just ahead of High Sun, this being the Faerunian term for noon. The most common accepted offering at a Temperan place of worship is the weapon of a defeated foe. A battle that truly tests the prowess of a Temperan is also accepted and viewed as a religious ceremony in dedication to the foe hammer. A popular ritual performed by the Temperan clergy for lay folk is a prayer said over a given worshipper's weapon. 
it is important that this weapon be used in an upcoming battle and be the preferred weapon of the individual. The prayer is said for not just success, but also heroic acts on the battlefield. If temporary clergy speak their prayer over a weapon that recently came into the possession of the individual through a prior battle or exchange, it is taken as an especially good omen. Daily each temple has the Feast of Heroes at High Sun, and sing the Song of the Fallen while the sun sets. Most temples also sing the Song of Swords during the night for lay folk. Tempurn worship practices have a bold and powerful tone to them to reflect the essence of combat and battle. Many practices involve ritual combat, though not to the death. Each Tempurn temple tends to have their own separate time set aside in the year to acknowledge and reflect on the anniversaries of important battles in a region's history. Specifically, at the Abbey of the Sword, which will be discussed later, one battle is remembered through a reenactment on the Abbey's training grounds. Another anniversary is celebrated by placing a ring of opponent's skulls around the Abbey's altar, while the full tale of the Battle of Swords Creek is recounted. This battle is notable throughout the entire Temperan faith. Tempus's avatar appeared to mark the sacrifice of a Temperan warrior's life to take down a sizable Zentarum force. Other Temperan places of worship may travel out to a past battlefield and raise a war monument, or they may travel out to an established war monument in commemoration and worship. The Feast of the Moon, the festival day held between the bonds of Uktar and Nital, is the one holy day in the Temperan faith celebrated continent-wide. On this day, the clergy show honor to the warrior dead during the March of the Dead. During this march, Temperans recite the names of great warriors who have passed. They also invite all who they pass by to the local Temperan place of worship. I posit that there is a meal or feast held at the temple to go alongside other Temperan rites. General Characteristics of Places of Worship Temperan temples double as both military fortifications and places of worship. Such temples are well stocked and built with the intent to hold off any enemy with a small contingent of Temperans manning the defenses. A central place exists to honor Tempus and those who have fallen in battle. Here you will find their battered armor and rusted weapons. Some Temperan temples and abbeys may have libraries. Though these libraries cater to housing records of falling warriors in history of battle and past conflicts. While weapons training is often free to the general public in a given settlement, Temperan temples will offer to repair martial equipment for a fee. Individualized weapons training may be on offer for a fee depending on who the instructor is. The forges in a Temperan place of worship are busy throughout the day. The clergy not only make martial equipment, but forge metallic items of use to the surrounding community. They readily accept payment for the service as well. Some lay folk believe that a donation to Tempest in this fashion prevents war from reaching their homes. Temperan shrines are often decorated with the broken arms and armor from those who won them from their opponents in battle. Some shrines may even take on a grislier air with the heads of monsters adorning set shrines. Some temples hold rarely seen champion frays where warriors participate in martial tourneys and competitive events like jousting or melees. Specific Places of Worship And folks, just bear with me, this is going to be an extra long section of the podcast. The Abbey of the Sword is a Tempuran abbey that stands five miles southwest of Assembra in the Dale Lands. Shortly after the Time of Troubles, Tempurans took an abandoned and ancient hold and repurposed it as an abbey. Tempest was thought to be seen by a Temperan cleric during the Time of Troubles. This sighting occurred during a battle nearby Swords Creek. The cleric made their way towards a ruined hold once owned by a Temperan worshipper, following Tempest's trail of gemstones. While standing upon the site, this cleric received a vision from Tempest, confirming in this cleric's mind that this was where Tempest arrived during the Time of Troubles. Though as I mentioned before, this is still up for debate by scholars and Temperans alike. The Abbey of the Sword is described as a bland and squat stone fortress. The Temperans here protect Battledale and often come into conflict with the drow who reside both below and upon the surface of Cormanthor. 
Their first run-in with the drow came in 1371 Dale Reckoning. In the underground level of the abbey, the Temperans have dug down to an underground lake which serves as a source of fresh water, though at the time the Temperans found numerous portals and began to set watches by these portals. A specific clan of Veyrun worshipping drow came through a yet-to-be-found portal and clashed with the Temperans. The drow were able to get past the Temperan defenders and found subsequent means to gain passage beneath the bows of Cormand Thor. The abbey has strong communal ties throughout the Dale Lands. First, they forge all sorts of armor and weapons that they reasonably price for different Dale Land militias. Second, the Temperans train both these militias and house or dispatch trainers out to the various hamlets and villages. Third, lower-ranking clergy travel out to the various Temperan shrines in the Dales to preside over services for the communities. The Abbey of the Swords has an alliance with the Shantian Abbey of the Golden Sheaf in nearby Mistledale. Arms, missives, food stores, and healing services are often traded between the two abbeys. The altar in the Abbey is a shield-shaped dais. Above this altar floats the magical shield of a Temperan hero. Presently, the abbey complex has apparently expanded further. A small settlement called Ambrose surrounds the abbey. The name Ambrose was chosen to honor the founder of the Abbey of the Sword. There is far more detail about the Abbey of the Sword in 2nd editions, Willow's Guide to the Dale Lands, and 3rd editions, Face and Pantheons. Face and Pantheons also contains a map of the abbey itself. The House of Heroes is the Temperan Temple in the Sea Ward of Waterdeep. It is the largest Watertavian temple. Several combatants and spectators pay their respects from the nearby Field of Triumph. Those who are victorious in ward-specific competitions come to this temple to be celebrated as they are carried around by a gleeful crowd. In the Shackles Ward of Calimport is the Beacon of Battle. This tempering red-glazed brick building houses clergy who seek out and recruit gladiators among the slave population of the city. Through gladiatorial combat and the attention of the Temperan clergy, a slave may acquire a better life for themselves. Staying in Calimport in the Trades Ward can be found the Arms House. This temple serves as a barracks and school for some of the gladiators. Gladiators receive training from the Temperan clergy and live under the temple's roof. An underground tunnel leads directly to the arena allowing the gladiators the freedom to travel to both places without a supervising authority. A shrine to Tempest found in Shadowdale is built on the site of the Second Battle of Shadowdale. The shrine is built not just to commemorate the battle, but also to venerate all warriors who have sacrificed their lives defending the Dale Lands. The shrine is made of two iron pillars which frame a black basalt altar. Tempest's symbol emblazons the front of the altar in gold color. Flowers are often left here. On the anniversary of the second battle, people tie bright ribbons around both pillars. Across the Temperan faith, it is accepted that the High House of Swords and Banners, also known as the Blood Hall, is the most prominent temple of the faithful. This temple can be found in Orm Patar, the capital of Sespec, in the Vilhan Reach region of Faerun. This temple complex holds within its walls what is thought to be the first shrine of Tempest. The shrine is a large bowl over which a flaming greatsword levitates. Long ago, mercenary bands would meet at the shrine. There have been attempts made to raid the armories held within the High House, but all have failed in their attempts. Within the walls of Dragonspear Castle is a ruined Temperan temple once called the Hold of the Battle Lines. The castle was cleared of the hobgoblins who had taken up residence and the victorious forces out of Baldur's Gate and Waterdeep saw fit to establish this temple in the castle's cellars. A sizable force of undead invaded Dragonspear Castle and slew the Temperan defenders stationed at the shrine. Sentel Keep may still yet house a Temperan shrine called Battle Hall, whether it is still active or in ruins itself. The shrine was designed to look like a reduced fort. Spears line the battlements displaying the skulls of past invaders. The Temperan clergy call their faithful for veneration by slamming an unwieldy large mace against a brass shield. More skulls, bloodied arms, and armor decorated the interior. The scent of blood mingled with that of oiled metal throughout. Underneath the shrine are the shelves of honor, 
catacombs where heroic warriors are laid with deep respect. The Temple to Tempest in Byzantur is a granite fortress guarded by a large iron gate. Statues of Tempest exist on both sides of this gate. On the left, Tempest rides Veros. On the right, Tempest rides Deros. Above the iron gate is the holy symbol of Tempest. The House of War is a large temple in Raven's Bluff. It was built both to intimidate and awe with its tall pillars, bas-relief carvings of fighters and warriors on the outer walls. Through some of these carvings, wands on the inside of the wall can shoot out gouts of flame, lightning bolts, rays of negation, or rays of polymorph in defense of the temple. The rays of polymorph in particular attempt to change would-be attackers into snails, with the attackers' names written upon their snail shell. The inside of the house is patrolled by towering, animated halberds and battle axes. Mundane arms and armor may be rented out from the house, though they also rent out siege equipment and engines as well. I will add that there is a detailed write-up with maps of the House of War in Polyhedron Magazine issue 115. The High Hall of Swords in Molemaster is a grim granite fortress temple. The exterior walls and battlements are decorated with well-worn shields, broken armor, and dull cracked weapons. The battlements feature the heads of cowards in various stages of decomposition stuck on pikes. Kelvin's Cairn is a holy mountain venerated by the ragged barbarians in Icewind Dale. It is told that Tempest did battle with a frost giant named Kelvin Dural. After Tempest beat and killed the giant, Tempest took large stones from the plains around him and placed them over top the corpse of Kelvin. This Tempest did as a reminder that Kelvin's wrath brought about his own death. The Table of the Sword is Daggerfur's Temper and Shrine. This is a simple shrine, enclosed by worn wood and decorated by past spoils from Dragonspear Castle. The Towers of War in Monk's Blade is one of four monasteries left in ruin. This Temperan monastery in particular serves as the home of the local Fire Dagger Inn. When the monasteries were on their last legs, a group of evil mages attempted to loot these monasteries. Warriors dedicated to Taiki, goddess of fortune who existed prior to being split in twain to form Bashaba and Taimora, and Tempest made a last stand by a well shared between the monasteries. Six of these warriors were peppered with arrows and killed while trapped in an Otto's irresistible dance spell. Their apparitions may appear around this well when the moon is out. Those who bear a symbol of Tempest or Taiki may have their way to ruins or buried treasure, if such treasure has not already been taken, pointed out to them by the apparitions. A local tale that is also supported by Tempurans is that magical swords were secreted away by the Taiki and Tempuran faithful. As of yet, they remain undiscovered in hidden vaults. In Hull Tale, a local legend tells of nine black blades that can be called forth by a Tempuran from the local lake. These blades will then seek out a given target or targets and attack. Elminster, however, points out that it does not necessarily need to be a Tempuran to activate these enchanted blades. Rather, a person simply needs to learn the phrase of activation and control the blades. It is possible that a Tempuran temple once existed in Halltale, but has since been claimed by time. In Wyvern Hunt stands Spear Rock, a roughly hewn Tempuran shrine. Tempuran faithful make offerings and prayers at the shield stone, a boulder that resembles the shape of an altar. It is said that Tempest has a habit of listening intently to those prayers made at Spear Rock. Some who have prayed here are later aided by bolts of lightning that rain down on their foes, even from cloudless skies. Tempest's voice has reportedly spoken to worshippers as well here at Spear Rock. Tempest will inform the worshipper of the location of a given foe. Local tales speak to an archer's inability to miss while shooting arrows at Spear Rock. As an example, an outlaw was able to take out a patrol of purple dragon knights from his position at Spear Rock. Warriors make their pilgrimages here, and Tempuran clergy will travel to Spear Rock occasionally to collect the offerings and maintain the shrine's image. Tempest's tears unfortunately does not have any real significance for the Tempuran faith. Rather, it is a village where dwarves and gnomes live under the ruins of towers and buildings of some forgotten Kalashite settlement.
A standing stone is all that remains to mark where a peace treaty was agreed upon. The standing stone is inscribed with the following, quote, Here was peace this day made. Let Tempest cry bitter tears, and so on and so forth. There's far more to Tempest's tears, and it is a genuinely interesting locale, though none of its features have anything to do with Tempest. Along the road between Hillsfar and Eulash are a series of cairns of those who fell during the Battle of Falling Wasps. At this battle, the Red Plumes were able to take a sizable Zentarum force, though many of their own died. The Red Plumes are a mercenary company based out of Hillsfar, who also formed the local guard. A priest from Hillsfar sanctified these cairns as a temper and holy site and shrine. A marker stands at these cairns to mark the name of the battle and a blessing given to the site. The red plumes out of Hillsfar occasionally take a flagstone from back home to form a paved surface around the marker. The red plumes who lay these stones etch the name of one of their fallen comrades on the stone surface. Tempest is a civic deity in Lapelgard a fortress city in the civic confederation of Lapalia. Telkarn in the border kingdoms once was home to a small temper and temple. The clergy here were able to remove the stone and slate building from the site of destruction caused by a magical combat between the cult of the dragon, red wizards of Thay, and Zentarum mages. The temple has of yet to return to its original site for what is well over two centuries now. It is thought that with the right magic, the temple can be brought back from where it went, and that the clergy have not brought back themselves since they have been killed by a monster who was hiding within the temple. To the south of Neverwinter, and along the high road, stands a wayside shrine to Tempest called the Shrine of Swords. An altar is enclosed by a dome that has been made from scrap pieces of weapon and armor to form the rough shape of a gauntlet. The altar has a permanent glow to it and it is made of interlocking shields. This altar is then supported by interlaced swords. For a night, the shrine will protect travelers who make an offering of a weapon. The shrine has been hallowed in such a way so that no blood may be shed in its immediate area. Furthermore, anyone attempting to attack the shrine and its inhabitants must deal with seven animated swords. A concealed trapdoor is meant only for temperance to travel through. Those attempting to do so without proper passphrases or attempt pern in their company must deal with the helmed horror down below and the aforementioned animated swords. Down past the trapdoor can be found an array of oiled and well-maintained weapons. Far more specifics and illustrations for the Shrine of Swords can be found in Dragon Issue 285. A popular pilgrimage route for Temperans to take following the Time of Troubles is the Trail of Tears. While the Foe Hammer traveled the face of Faerun during the Time of Troubles, he visited four battle sites and left behind him a trail of Tempest weeping gems. Temperans were later able to trace the War God's trail, and a portal network now exists to travel Tempest's path. These four portals take a person from the fields of the dead in the Western Heartlands. Swords Creek and Mistledale, the Fields of Nun in eastern Shondath, and to the Thark of Thaz Zalar on Thay's southern border. The first portal in the Fields of the Dead is a ghostly circle of helmets on the ground. This portal only appears at midnight and when a full moon is out. This portal will lead you into a familiar location, the Abbey of Swords out in the Dalelands. A permanent illusion of red gems appear upon exiting the first portal. It will lead you to the second portal found in Swords Creek in Mistledale. Much like the first portal, the second portal arises only at midnight, though a full moon does not need to be present. This portal resembles a ring of skulls hovering over the bank of the creek. In order to pass through this portal, though, someone needs to be blood-soaked. Coming out of the second portal, a temperan arrives in the fields of none the site of the concluding battle of the Rotting War that we mentioned much earlier in the episode. The illusionary tears lead an individual towards a barrow mound where the plague-ridden combatants in the Rotting War were interred. The third portal also appears at midnight. This portal has no real defining appearance, but it requires that those attempting passage be afflicted with a disease. 
This portion of the trail, however, offers the likely prospect of contracting a disease with the many undead nearby. The third portal leads to the site of the Battle of Thazalar and Thay that took place in 922 Dale Reckoning. Following the illusionary tears once more, a Tempurin is led to an underground tunnel that is a tight fit for any medium-sized creature. If successful in not having the tunnel caved in on your person, an individual comes out to the Dark Crypt. The Dark Crypt is a memorial that was built for Ray, a Moharandi deity felled by Grumsh during the Orc Gate Wars of negative 1076 Dale Reckoning. The Dark Crypt is a proper dungeon that holds all sorts of consequences depending on the Tempurin's actions here. Anyone who wears a symbol of Tempest truthfully will then unknowingly manifest a portal via the archway that leads into the Dark Crypt's forecourt. Taking this final portal leads a Tempurin back to the same hill out in the fields of the dead where they first started the pilgrimage. When each portal arises, creatures either summoned or who haunt the area will make themselves present for battle. The goal then is to participate in these battles. Each battle has been engineered in such a way so that Tempest teaches his faithful a particular lesson about combat. I have included a link to the first web article that Wizards of the Coast published to introduce the small series of articles about the Trail of Tears. Wizards of the Coast recently took down the archive of these articles from the 3rd edition era, but by utilizing the Wayback Machine, you should still be able to access these articles going forward. The Tempurn Abbey called the House of Swords stands a little ways from Glister. This abbey is self-sufficient with several large gardens tended to by the clergy stationed here. They operate as a guard force for Glister. Outside Tempurns of good standing can take magic weapons or armor on loan from the House of Swords. After they are done, they can pay for their loans with other magic items or gold. Named temples to Tempest include Hall of Warriors in Luskin, Vault of Swords in Hillsfar, the House of Glory in Tantris, the Towers of the Vengeful Hand in Eshperta. Named shrines to Tempest include Shrine of Cross Swords in Scardale Town, Shrine of Swords in the Sword Point Fortress in Arkendale, the Hand That Swings the Sword in Elturel, Swords Point Hall in Birddusk, and the Old Sharp Sword in Hill's Edge. Unnamed temples to Tempest can be found in Prosker, one of the Parafall garrisons in Taniston Barony, doubles as a Temper and Temple, Eulash, and High Castle. Unnamed shrines to Tempest can be found in Assembra, various communities in Tasseldale, Suzale, Serlune, Ermlasper, Melvant, Vunlar, Kalant, within the Tower of Shaba and Shadowdale, Arabelle, Iriabor, within the Golden Fortress, primary garrison of Esperta, Vunlar, Thentia, Arabar, Alcon, Ormoth, Lachelle, Nempet, and Newfort. Character Options For 2nd edition, the Battle Guard Specialty Priest can be found in Face and Avatars. A unique feature for Temper and Crusaders and the Battle Forge and Glory Blood Priest variants can be found in Warriors and Priests of the Realms. For 4th edition, in Forgotten Realms Player's Guide can be found Tempest's Glare, a specific utility power for those who have taken the chosen Epic Destiny, and then the Righteous of Tempest Channel Divinity feat. Next is just a breakdown of the features that I think someone deeply involved in Tempest's faith would have for their background in 5th edition. For your two skill proficiencies, Athletics and Intimidation. For your language or tool proficiencies, two of leather worker's tools, mason's tools, or smith's tools. For your equipment, there's the soldiers from the player's handbook, the knight of the order, the mercenary veteran, or the Uthgarb tribe member from Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide. The ribbon feature of your background could be the acolyte shelter of the faithful, the folk hero's rustic hospitality, the nobles, specifically the knight variant retainers, and then the soldier's military rank, all found in the player's handbook. Or it could be the Knights of the Order's Knightly Regard, the Mercenary Veteran's Mercenary Life, 
or the Uthgard tribe members' Uthgard heritage from Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide. The following is a list of subclasses I think would be thematically appropriate for an NPC or PC to take if they are a worshipper of Tempest. For the Barbarian, there's the Path of the Berserker from the Player's Handbook, Path of the Storm Herald, Path of the Zealot, and Path of the Ancestral Guardian, all from Xanathar's Guide to Everything. For the Bard, there's the College of Valor from the Player's Handbook, and the College of Swords from Xanathar's Guide to Everything. For the Cleric, there's of course the War Domain from the Player's Handbook. For the Fighter, there's the Battle Master and Champion Fighter from the Player's Handbook, and then the Cavalier from Xanathar's Guide to Everything. For the Paladin, there's the Oath of Glory from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. For the Sorcerer, there is the Divine Soul Sorcerer from Xanathar's Guide to Everything. For the Wizard, there is the Ward Wizard from Xanathar's Guide to Everything. Dungeon Master Options To start, let's just touch on some official 5th edition stat blocks for creatures that Tempest's Faith or himself might use. From the Monster Manual, there's the Eagle, Badger, Warhorse, Mastiff, Panther, Tiger, Animated Armor, Flying Sword, and Helmed Horror. From Curse of Strahd, there's the Animated Hellbird. Finally, from Baldur's Gate Descent into Avernus, there's the Flying Dagger. On Harriar are creatures we do not have a 5th edition stat block for, but these are Celestial Warriors who might be better known to you through Norse myth and indeed have a large presence on the outer plane of Ysgard. They can be found in the 3rd edition supplement Deities and Demigods, 2nd edition's Monstrous Compendium Outer Plains Appendix, and Planescape Monstrous Compendium Appendix, and finally 1st edition's Manual of the Plains. Next is just a section on stat blocks that you could use for humanoid NPCs who could be temperance in your games. For the monster manual, there's the Acolyte, Berserker, Gladiator, Priest, Tribal Warrior, and Veteran. From Icewind Dale, Rhyme the Frost Maiden, there's the Ragged Chieftain, Ragged Great Warrior, Ragged Shaman, Ragged Warrior. From Baldur's Gate Descent into Avernus, Despite the name, I think you could easily reskin versions of the Clergy of Bane that are presented in that book, specifically the Black Gauntlet of Bane, the Fist of Bane, and the Iron Console. From Curse of Strahd, there's the Phantom Warrior. From Mythic Odysseys of Theros, there's the Crowan Hoplite and Satestan Hoplite. From Volo's Guide to Monsters, there's the Champion, War Priest, and Warlord. Finally, from Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, there's the Frontline Medic and the Soldier. Let's talk about some specific temper and magic items. The War Widow appears to be a well-worn and partially damaged Warhammer that is a relic in the temper and faith. Its shaft is covered partially by a torn black sackcloth. While fighting off the invasion of the Tegan Horde in 1360 Dale Reckoning, Members of the Order of the Steel Fang pray to their patron deity to assist them in combating what they have perceived to be the underhanded tactics of the Horde. In response, Tempest placed a few of these relics in their respective armories. The War Widow grants its wielder a significant bonus to saving throws against traps, poisons, and diseases. It also holds the Anarchic property, a third edition property, and a plus two enchantment to damage and to hit. The relic comes with the caveat that it must be used in meaningful combat at least once every 10 day for all its properties to still be present. Otherwise, it becomes a mundane warhammer, until the wheeler finds themselves in their next battle. The details of the War Widow can be found in Dragon Issue 333. The Red Book of War is an overly large temperan relic and tome. It is roughly 2 feet wide and 3 feet tall. The metallic covers of the Red Book were shaped out of armor plates hammered down, shaped, and then bound and hinged. It is but one of six similar such tomes, but it is only one to have gone missing. There are 51 pages in this book, all made from burnished copper. Each of these 51 pages contain the stamped details of individual spells held to be holy in the faith. No image can be found on the covers of this book. A permanent fairy fire enchantment gives the pages a flickering red glow. 
After refusing the pay into the protection racket being extorted by the Shadow Masters and Teflam, the Tempura Tower of Tempest was broken into by the Shadow Masters in 1353 Dale Reckoning. The Shadow Masters took the Red Book along with other treasures. All save the Red Book would be found after the Shadow Masters fell into infighting. The Guild Master of the Shadow Masters then sailed off on his own personal ship, fleeing the conflict, only to then be caught in a violent storm on the Sea of Fallen Stars. Sustaining heavy damage, the ship sunk to the sea floor ten miles north of the Cape of Dragon Fang. There the Red Book of War remains to this day. Information on the Red Book of War can be found in 1st Edition's Forgotten Realms Campaign Box Set and 2nd Edition's Sea of Fallen Stars Supplement. The Prayer of Anger is a magical greatsword with an inherent plus two greatsword that grants its user immunity to fear and allows the wielder to rage for longer than they otherwise might be able to. These holy greatswords can be found with a temper and holy symbol inscribed upon them. To wrap up the section on magic items, the following are some thematically appropriate magic items from official 5th edition sources I feel the faith that Tempest may have access to. From the Dungeon Master's Guide, there's plus 1 through to plus 3 armor, weapons, and ammunition. Adamantine armor, animated shield, armor of resistance, arrow catching shield, cloak of protection, Darren's instant fortress, defender, gauntlets of ogre power, Horn of Valhalla, Horseshoes of a Zephyr, Horseshoes of Speed, Mace of Smiting, Oil of Sharpness, Periapt of Wound Closure, Ring of Protection, Rod of Lordly Might, Saddle of the Cavalier, Scimitar of Speed, and Vicious Weapon. From Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, reskinned versions of the Boros Guild Signet and Gruul Guild Signet. From Explorer's Guide to Wildmount, the Battering Shield, and the Weapon of Certain Death. From Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, plus one to plus three Amulets of the Devout. From Tales from the Yawning Portal, Shatter Spike. From Xanathar's Guide to Everything, Cast Off Armor, Dread Helm, and Smoldering Armor. Alright, thank you for listening to Religion in the Realms. If you're interested in keeping up with the release of future episodes, you can follow the podcast Twitter account at Realms Religion. These episodes are uploaded to YouTube as well. Audio versions of the podcast can be found on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and Google Podcasts. If you wish to get in touch with me with any questions or just want to chat, my personal Twitter handle is at Shivs Embrace, or you can send an email to realmsreligion at gmail.com, all in lowercase. In the next episode, I will be covering the Red Knight, the lawful neutral goddess of strategy and tactics. Until next time, may Timora look kindly upon your dice rolls, help protect you, and Lathander light your path. Music for this episode, Crossing the Chasm by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com, licenses under Creative Commons.